Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I'm wearing one of my fancy booktube hats. And today I'm doing a sort of part two of my April wrap-up. I already did a wrap-up for all of the books that I read during the two readathons that I participated in in April, which were the Tome Topple and the Unicorn Readathon. And those were sort of some of the more substantial books that I read during the month. And this is going to be, I think, more of a hodgepodge. I'll link that wrap up for you in case you missed it. You can check that out. Um, and I didn't do like a thumbnail with a stack of books because most of these are going to be things I either read on my Kindle or have gone back to the library. So that would be like a really disappointing looking uh, thumbnail. So I'll, I'll do something else for my thumbnail. Jazz hair! Know. But I've actually got like five and a half-ish things to cover here, um, some of which I had some really mixed feelings on, but the first two of which uh, fortunately were things I really liked. The first book I finished in April, like way back, I actually read most of this in March and then I finished it right at the beginning of April, was The Seventh Bride by T. Kingfisher. So it's been a while since I've read this now, um, but I liked this. Uh, T. Kingfisher is Ursula Vernon writing adult fairy tale fantasy under a pen name so as not to cause confusion in terms of what's appropriate to give to small children and what is not. Um, this is too creepy and adult to give to small children, but I honestly think that this would be fine as a YA book. It felt like something I would have really enjoyed in high school um, when I was reading a ton of young adult fairy tale retellings that was like my bread and butter reading when I was a teenager. Um, but this is a loose Bluebeard retelling. It follows a teenage Miller's daughter named Rhea who um, ends up engaged to be married to this lord, uh, even though the circumstances of the engagement seem really suspicious. There's a social class thing and you can't really say no if you're a Miller's daughter and a lord wants to marry you. Things get increasingly bizarre and less and less normal, and soon Rhea finds herself in some pretty great danger indeed. She is invited out to this lord's house, um, where she discovers that he is a sorcerer and has done all sorts of creepy things and has several previous wives, many of whom are actually still alive in this version, um, but all of whom have had something terrible done to them, something taken from them. And to avoid this fate herself, Rhea will have to keep Lord Cravan from marrying her. He sets her several increasingly challenging tasks that if she fails, he will marry her. I already mentioned I think that this is pretty creepy, but not actually in a way that I minded. Ursula Vernon has a very distinctive narrative voice. Um, it's the sort of thing where like, everything is creep-tastic and spooktacular, and our main character will take a look around and say, well, that's not normal. And it sort of alleviates the mood of the situation, even though nothing is actually any better. I think that sort of theme of this book is um, people faced with spectacularly outrageous, creepy magic and just trying to make sense of it in a basic human way when the sense is not necessarily there to be made. On that sort of psychological level, this book actually reminded me a good deal of the humor in Sunshine by Robin McKinley, um, which is told in a very different style. It's urban fantasy, whereas this is high fantasy. Um, but I sort of never thought I would find a book that in narrative tone would remind me of Sunshine, and now I have and I'm quite pleased. So yeah, I liked this. I think I'd kind of call it YA more than adult, um, but it doesn't have any romance in it. So if you're looking for a sort of fairy tale retelling young adult style book with no romance, this is one that I might recommend. It also has a really fabulous hedgehog. I gave this book four out of five stars. The next thing I read in the month uh, was Amberlo by Laura Elena Donnelly. This has gone back to the library, but I kind of managed to, um, to forget that I hadn't wrapped this up yet, so here goes. This is very accurately, I think, pitched as like the musical cabaret, but as a fantasy world spy thriller. It follows a group of characters during the rise of a uh, 
fascist-like totalitarian regime, so it's obviously got, like, timely and relevant written all over it, even though it's set in a world that's meant to resemble 1930s Germany. It's got all that vintage flair, but obviously there's a reason to choose to, uh, write a fantasy world that resembles that time and place now. I've kind of described this before as, like, what if Cliff from Cabaret were a spy entangled in all sorts of espionage um, and in a romantic relationship with the MC instead of with Sally Bowles, and the Sally Bowles character was more of a side character. What's going on politically is that uh, we are in Amberlow City, which is the capital of Amberlow, one of several states that are part of a uh, unified entity where each state has its own head of government um, in one of the other states, there's an election where uh, the far right wing leader of a nationalist movement to unify the states under totalitarian rule um, is up for election and the polls say he's not going to win. But, you know, we all know what, uh, <laughs> what that means, don't we? At the beginning of the book, Cyril, our spy, is sent on an undercover mission to try to figure out what he can about what's going on in this election. It does not go well and things just get worse from there. What you have a lot of in this story is people you like, characters you like, making morally indefensible decisions that seem reasonable at the time in order to save their own skins, but end up having just horrific consequences in the long run. It's a very raunchy book. It's a very brutal book. Um, it's a story where it may surprise you who comes out in the end with any sort of, you know, claim to moral righteousness. One thing I wished there had been, and this is actually pretty rare for me because when they appear in fantasy books I usually don't use them, is I wished there had been a glossary in this. There is a lot going on in this book that's largely on the periphery that was hard for me to keep track of, and I think that's what kept it from being a five-star book for me. I gave it four stars. Um, I, I needed a little bit more of some of this other stuff in order to put some of the pieces together. There's a lot in terms of political figures who are majorly important but aren't actually characters who show up in the book. I could have used some help remembering who was who in terms of those people, in terms of political donors, in terms of, um, you know, religious and ethnic groups. I also had a hard time following some of the economics um, that were presented in this world that were really important. Um, I, I kind of felt like I was missing some things. There are looming questions of whose way of life is going to be threatened, who is going to be seen as other when this government comes to power and who's going to be in danger. Obviously this book focuses on a gay couple, um, but also there is a religious element going on. There's an old religion that uh, the Ospies, the party rising to power, don't like. There are tensions between this socially conservative religious movement um, and this older religion and these ethnic minorities. One thing that really stood out to me once I finished the book um, was the realization that this actually has a much lower body count death toll as a book than a whole ton of other fantasy that you might read, but it takes all of the violence in the book so much more seriously than you often see. None of it is there as just a plot device or an action sequence, so I felt like the horrible things that happened in this book had a much larger impact on me than um, than I get from a lot of the fantasy books I read that have far higher body counts. Next I have two graphic novels, um, both of which I gave a three-star rating to, um, and both of which have gone back to the library, which is 
a shame because it's hard to talk about graphic novels without being able to show you the art. I'm leaving behind all semblance of talking about these things in the order in which I read them. By the way, I'm talking about them now in the order <laughs> in which I want to talk about them. Um, but first I'm going to talk about Descender Volume 2, Machine Moon. This is by Jeff Lemire with art by Dustin Nagoyan. Of course, this is uh, one of the Booktube SFF Award nominees, uh, which is why I'm reading it. I was reading it for the read-alongs. Um, after reading the first volume, I probably wouldn't have continued with this series if I hadn't read the first volume just to read volume two for the read-alongs. I basically went into this much more interested in the art than in the story. It is painted in watercolor, which is, you know, technically very exciting to look at. I couldn't do a side-by-side -side comparison because these were library books, but I thought that the art in volume two was more varied and more interesting. There were there was more interesting use of color, more interesting variety and style than the first volume. I still don't think the story is all that special or all that unique. Um, I'm still not that invested in any of the characters. This is about the adventures of a little robot boy called Tim21 who wakes up in a uh, world that has turned hostile to AIs because of a giant evil robot attack that caused havoc some years prior. Lots of people have figured out that Tim21 might have some sort of programming connection to the attack robots and they want to figure it out, and it all sucks because he's basically just a kid. Volume 2 has an expanding cast of characters, and there's just more in terms of plot and subplot going on now. I'm still not finding it totally thrilling, but uh, this series does know how to do a good cliffhanger, and cliffhangers work on me. Um, I am now invested enough in the story after two volumes that I do kind of need to know what happens next, so I think I will be continuing on with this series, even though it's not my favorite thing in the world. So, yeah, now I have a graphic novel series that I'm reading. And these are super short, they're like read them in one sitting type graphic novels. Now, as you may be aware, or you may not, um, I've not been the greatest reader of graphic novels in the past. I have a hard time finding ones that I like. Um, so, I kind of put a random library hold on something that I saw a recommendation for somewhere on the internet, I forget where, that I thought, ooh, that might be good, um, because I'm sort of bumbling around in the dark trying to find the graphic novels that I'm going to like, um, which is kind of hard because the really popular stuff, for the most part, doesn't appeal to me all that much. Um, so the other graphic novel that I read in the month of April was called Mirror the Mountain. This is by Emma Rios and Hui Lim. It also looks like watercolor, although I don't think most of it is actually hand done. I think most of it is computer done. I think the chapter heading pages looked like they were hand painted, but none of the rest of it did. It's got like this pretty dreamy pastel style though that, that I liked. Um, I think this is a standalone. I think this is supposed to be a completed story arc. And I picked this up because it looked like a really fascinating blend of sci-fi and fantasy. It takes place on a sort of terraformed asteroid where there are these mage scientists who have been creating hybrid animal people for some purpose that's not really explained, that's got something to do with a war that we never really learned anything about. So that was the first of my problems with this book. We follow both some of the human magician scientists as well as this um, dog woman who is becomes this rebel leader of the animal people. There are also these guardians who are like sentient animals and where and why they come from, I really don't know. Um, they, they're sort of like guardian spirits of the asteroid. The asteroid itself is possibly alive in some way, and it's all connected to how these people ended up on this asteroid in the first place. Everything is told out of chronological order, and it almost seemed to me like it was told in intentionally the most opaque way possible. It was very hard to tell sometimes where in the chronology a certain scene was taking place. Um, characters looked different depending on what age they were, and it was hard for me to figure out 
when a character who showed up was actually someone I already knew. I was flipping back and forth constantly because there are things that show up in earlier scenes, earlier chapters, um, that you have no idea what they are, if they're supposed to be important, that get explained later. So I feel like I spent way longer reading this graphic novel than it was kind of worth in the end, because in the end you only get some like really sketchy explanations, um, and there just wasn't enough of a payoff for me for how much effort I put into understanding it. And it frustrated me because, like, the story elements were all really interesting to me. It seemed very magic system-y with this science magic stuff that was clearly very technically complicated, um, but just didn't get any development, um, any time devoted to, you know, explaining how it worked. And this was a story that I thought would have been way better served by a regular novel as opposed to a graphic novel. I would have given up all of the pretty art for some more clear and concise explanations of what was happening. So I feel like this was a story that I could have been really, really into in a different format, and that frustrated me. I gave it three stars. And the last two things I've put off for last, even though they weren't the last things I read, um, but they're things that I'm not really gonna talk about here. First, there is Sealskin by Sue Bristow, um, which I read as a NetGalley arc. I have already done a full video review of this, which I'll link for you. This is a Selkie story, and I had serious problems with it, even though it was really beautifully written. If you're interested, please check out my review. And then I also read The Queen of Erin Darkness, which is the second book in The Once and Future King, which is a bind-up of four books. Um, by T.H. White, classic Arthurian stuff. I'm not really enjoying this. I'm kind of saving up all of my snarky quips about this, though, for a, a video once I'm actually done with the whole book. Interestingly, I think The Queen of Air and Darkness is like a replacement text for the Bind Up Once and Future King version of this. I think when it was originally published in a series, there was a different second book that got, like, rewritten and replaced for The Once and Future King. Um, I realized this because I considered just DNFing it at this point and marking each of the individual books as read, but you can't just mark The Queen of Air and Darkness as a book because it was it wasn't published originally in that form. But I do want to finish this, though, so I can say I've read it and so I can do some sort of snarky summary reaction video to it. Um, I'm supposed to be reading The ill Made Night this month. I haven't started it yet, but it is possible that books three and four will change my mind. I'm trying to keep an open mind. I don't think it's bad, necessarily. It's just not working for me. So those were the rest of the things I read in April. Let me know what you think. Um, anyhow, I hope you're having a nice day. Bye for now.